Today I'm going to talk about and show you how to do multiple master type design in FontLab Studio 5. And uh, so we're going to talk about first what multiple master fonts are, what they can do for type design, how you create MMs in FontLab Studio, how you generate fonts from those multiple master designs, some problems that people tend to run into, and give you some resources and links. So first off, what are multiple masters? So long ago, <clears throat> back in the prehistory of, of digital type design, like 24 years ago, Adobe introduced a standalone format called Multiple Master, which was a variant of their PostScript Type 1 fonts. And that was cool and all. Those are pretty much long dead. But besides that, besides being their own format, they're also a type design tool. Now, even from those early days, there's this really useful document, TechNote 5091, 5091, and there's a link to it and there's going to be links at the end and we'll make the recording available so you don't have to like try and scribble down the whole URL. But um, this explains a lot about what multiple masters are and how they work. So in short, multiple master fonts involve design axes. In the traditional version of multiple master, at each extreme of the design, you need a separate master, a separate essentially a separate font. So for instance, if you wanted to have a multiple master that went from very light to very bold, you would have a really light font with the outline that looked like this and a really bold font where the outline for that glyph looked like this. So that means that once you have multiple masters, each master is essentially a complete font, right? It's got to have all the glyphs of the font and all those glyphs need to be compatible with each other. And we'll talk later about what exactly that means. But essentially, same number of points, same kinds of positions relative to the glyphs in each glyph. So here, for instance, we have an axis of weight going from light to bold, width going from condensed to extended, style. This is an interesting one. Basically, you can do anything you want as long as you can do the transformation by moving some points around in what is otherwise sort of quotes the same outline. So for instance, in the style transformation where serifs come in, how is that working? That means that on this sans serif version here in the left, um, the serif, the points for the serif have to still be there. By the way, can you guys see my pointer? I'm assuming you can. Cool. Good. Because that would be bad if you couldn't. <clears throat> um, that's another problem with being in presentation mode on uh, Keynote. So essentially the points for those for that serif are still there, collapsed in the sans serif, and then they gradually extrude as you move towards the more serif style. So when you have the two masters, what about all these in-betweens? Those are created by interpolation. So essentially you blend between those two masters and you can get any of the in-between states. And we'll see more on that later. Another common axis is optical size. So basically the idea is for a font optimized for smaller sizes, everything gets a little bolder, but especially the thins get thicker you know, what would be hairlines or very thin bits at a display size, like 72 point, have to get really sturdy for small sizes. And the same kind of principle, by the way, applies for web fonts. So the same kind of design you might use for like six point in print, you might be using something like that for 12 point on screen. And the converse is true. Something that's designed for really good on-screen usage can sometimes work very well at small sizes in print. Try Verdana at six point for print, like if you ever need to print tiny stuff on a spreadsheet or something. Anyhow, <clears throat> back to these outlines. So that's how each axis works. Well, what happens when you have multiple axes? Well, one axis font is simple, like for instance, from light to bold. There you go. 
you have one master here, one master here, and you interpolate between them. A two-axis font, let's say you've got a weight axis and a width axis. So you need to design the corners of the space. So a two-axis font, you would need four masters. Light extended, bold extended, light condensed, and bold condensed. A three-axis font then needs eight masters. So let's say you have an optical size axis as well. <coughs> so you have those same four masters, and then you have to double those for the two different optical sizes. And, and at that point, you have the design space, the range of possible designs is described by a cube. And a four-axis font is the point at which most people's heads explode because that's a hypercube. <coughs> So um, I tend to visualize this as actually a cube transmogrifying over time. So I use time as the fourth axis to wrap my head around it. But um, yeah, it's, it's hard to envision. And a four axis font would require 16 masters. <clears throat> In this case, they're imagining a font where the fourth axis is a range from old style to modern. So it's a style change. So that's all very well. <clears throat> what, can, what can MMs do for type design? Well, for starters, let's say that you have a, width, a weight axis. Here, you can have any weight in between these two extremes. So you only have to design the two fonts and everything else is created by interpolation, right? So you can do a lot of fonts from a few masters. Now to give you a few examples, Kepler has 16 masters, which is a lot. There are 168 fonts in that family, <clears throat> which is just absurd. Now I'll note that, by the way, when I say 16 masters, that's eight for the upright and eight for the italic. The italic are being done as a separate, you know, separate multiple master font. And so the italic instances get generated separately. Same thing for Myriad. So it's two four master MMs, but eight masters and 40 fonts. So you know, five times as many fonts. That's a lot less design work for you. Um, my own Hypatia Sands has uh, four masters and 12 fonts. And it's only a three to one growth, but hey, that's still better than designing 12 fonts. Um, you can also use these MM, this MM capability to adjust weight or width for some particular glyphs in the font. So let's say you've got small caps. Now, we all know that creating proper small caps means more than just shrinking down the caps. If you shrink down the caps, they get too wimpy. Well, what if you shrink down the caps and then up the weight a little using your handy MM capability, and hey, all of a sudden you've got small caps that actually match the weight uh, visually. Similarly, for superscript and subscript, you won't make them quite as heavy as the actual letters, you know, the regular letters in the font and numbers, but you will make them heavier than you would just by scaling down the, the regular ones. And similarly, you need small superscript and subscript like numbers for fractions. You could use these for other scaled kinds of things like the trademark, registered and copyright symbols, the uh, Spanish ordinals. So to give you an example of um, I, I went back and checked my own Hypatia Sans, which is a typeface. It has about 3,000 glyphs per font. And I went through and quickly counted stuff up. And I found that a bit over a third of the glyphs were created through MM stuff. MM, you know, the actual MM technology was involved in creating the base glyphs for about a third of the glyphs in the font. That's on top of the fact that once I had those complete fonts, I scaled everything, you know, I used interpolations to get more fonts. So that's pretty cool. Now that said, let's talk about creating multiple masters in FontLab Studio 5. So there are a bunch of ways to start a multiple master. Okay, it's the first one's almost cheating. You've already got a multiple master font as a font lab VFB or as an old fashioned back when they used to make them multiple master standalone font and you just open it. Okay, that is easy, of course. <clears throat> Another option is to create the axes in font lab and design in the multiple master space from there. 
And a third option is to bring separate fonts together, either by blending them or using Assign Master. And we're going to talk about each of these. So first, um, how to do a multiple master from scratch. Now, give me a second to fire up FontLab Studio on my excitingly low-res screen here. And, oh, I've already got a font open. Okay, I'll use this one, uh, even though it has lots of glyphs. Well, actually, I'm not going to use this one because it's not um, very uh, MM friendly. Let's try this thing here. The reason it's not MM friendly, by the way, is some of these designs are just not well suited to, for instance, doing a weight axis um, because of the odd stress of the font. However, this simple sans serif certainly is. So we go tools, multiple master, define new axis, and we're going to give it a weight axis. <clears throat> we say yes, go ahead, and it turns through the font, and nothing changed. And you're like, okay, that was exciting, and tell me again how this is interesting or useful. Now I'm going to zoom out a little. This font has some problems, but now one of the things, I was just moving the side bearings. You'll notice I have a master's panel here and an access panel. I think they may have been automatically popped open when I added the um, the axis, but you might have to sometimes open these, right? Uh, <clears throat> window, panels, axis, and masters. Now those won't even be options unless you already have at least one axis, right? Because they don't do anything otherwise. So weight 0 is the lightest weight, and weight 1 is the heaviest. Now you notice at the moment they have the same outlines, but I did move the side bearings, so now they have different side bearings. So that's something to keep in mind is that each master has its own widths of the glyphs, right? You know, side bearings, and they have their own kerning, and so on. They do not, however, have their own features. So if you do open type features, the, those will be shared across all your masters, um, with the exception of kerning. So let's I'm actually going to undo a couple of levels here because I just I want to keep these identical for the moment. Let's change weight one and quickly add some weight to it. <clears throat> and I'm going to do this really crudely, but not totally awfully. And And I'm going to turn on Preview. <coughs> and hey, you can interpolate between the weights. And moreover, if we go into a metrics window, oops, FontLab decided to open that on one of my other screens, which normally would be a fine thing, but not what I want today. If we go into the metrics window, You'll say, hey, why is that not doing anything? I need to, I can't be in metrics mode. Metrics mode only works right when you're able to adjust the side bearings in advance width. That only works when you're on one of the specific axes. So the sliders don't do anything when you're in metrics mode or kerning mode, same thing. However, if you are in just a simple preview mode in the metrics window, then the sliders work. Now, here's something interesting. You'll notice the sliders can actually go beyond zero and beyond a thousand. A thousand is the, the boldest master, and it can go further. Now I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not quite happy with the boldest master. I'm going to add a little more weight on the horizontal. And I think it looks a little too extended. I might do a separate weight axis. Normally, when you add weight, by the way, you typically are um, taking, adding some of the weight on the outside and some to the inside. So this just looked too bold. Go 
go back to the metrics window, slide my slider around. Now, of course, this would work equally well with having lots of glyphs and so on. But because we're doing this quickly. Now, one of the things about this add access approach, basically this ensures that your two fonts, your masters are always going to be in perfect sync, right? It's almost impossible to get them out of sync <clears throat> because FontLab started by just duplicating the one set of outlines. And of course, I didn't have side bearings yet. So that's the general idea. Now, one other thing you'll notice here is that at the moment you're just seeing one particular master in this window. Uh, you're seeing the lightest master. Now I could um, choose, what is it, edit axis graph? Oh no, that's not what I want. Font info actually. If I go into font info, there's a tab for multiple master settings. And here you can set the default weight vector. It's always weight vector even if you have a different axis or more than one. I'm going to set it to 500 and I could just type it. And that means for all of these glyphs, I'm going to be seeing sort of the middle interpolated weight. And at the moment, so right away I can suddenly see, hey, I've only actually done the weight changes for the D and now I need to do, you know, the rest of them. So that's the, the short version of how you start creating a multiple master from scratch. Now I know probably a lot of us all have made fonts that already have more than one axis in them. So, or sorry, more than one, have made typefaces where you've already got a regular and a bold and you might want to bring them together. So let's do that by blending fonts. So here's how you blend fonts. You open two fonts, you go to Tools, Blend Fonts, and select Build the Multiple Master Font, and hit OK. Really complicated, right? Um, now let me Oop, do I not have Sorry. I just realized I don't have, we're just going to pick, uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I can see I've done this before. We're going to take Lato hairline and Uh, Lato Black, and we will do Tools Blend Fonts, and I want the first font to be the hairline and the second font to be the black, because the weight traditionally goes from light to bold, and otherwise this will mess things up. So I click Build the Multiple Master Font, name of the axis, in this case it really is weight, <coughs> Now there's some extra um, settings here. In this case, I'm going to say, you know, I'm pretty sure these are all really compatible. So don't do anything to the nodes. Um, so there's two different options. One is if the outlines are compatible, that is they have the same number of nodes, don't change their type or add nodes. Um, and the second option is like, really believe these are compatible and even if, you know, never add nodes or rearrange contours, which means that if something fails, I'll have to sort of manually tweak the outlines. And we'll see this, what this means in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. This thing's going to turn away. And you can see that in this case, my assumption that everything was going to be hunky, you know, peachy keen and hunky dory in this is perhaps slightly off. Um, 
let's look at one of the ones that worked first. I'm going to zoom out so we can see stuff. And so that one is basically fine. Um, ah. So font audit is flagging something. And this is a funny thing because this particular option you can't turn on and off in font audit. Um, this is kind of a bad a bad last minute addition in font audit because um, it's flagging things that are not necessarily a problem. So I will cancel out of that and I will go uh, view and turn off font audit for now. So this one worked and we can interpolate and it's all good. Let's pick one that didn't like the two. And we can see in this case, both weight zero and weight one have the same two outline. But you'll see where it failed. The outline from the other font is in the background layer. And so as a result, you could manually move these outlines around to get to that point, right? You know, I could go, uh, er, and so on. Like I could move all these outlines around. Yes, it's a little bit of a pain, but it's a lot less of a pain than say, ooh, drawing all the intermediate weights from scratch. Of course, I wouldn't have to do this if I had designed these things with MMs in mind in the first place, right? The only reason I'm having to go through some extra steps is because I did not, um, you know, I just brought two fonts together that were already built. And it's not that bad. It's a little bit of a pain, but it's not that bad. And yeah, it would take me a minute. You know, I'd have to do some some reworking and zoom way in and twiddle some outlines around until until they were good. And I'm not going to do the whole thing right now, but <clears throat> and that's not actually a very good construction. And I know that, but I'm just showing you that you can do it. It would take, you know, a few minutes per glyph, which is a lot faster still than designing all these intermediate glyphs. Now, if I were to do that same thing, let's not save that. And let's do the same blend again, but um, Let's say, well, outlines aren't necessarily compatible. <clears throat> Some glyphs have a different number of contours in the first and second fonts and were not blended. So it's just a few cases. I can see which ones they are. Ord feminine registered. They're neatly highlighted in red. And the green highlighting indicates whether or not uh, FontLab had to add points or not. And I would have to double check and see which case it is. But I believe green means it did not have to add points. No, actually, let's look at this. I think white means it did not have to add points. I would have to double check that. <coughs> oh, wait. If that's green. Yeah, green means it doesn't have to add points. Anyhow, um, <coughs> and dot accent. Yeah, you don't get much simpler than a circle. So green means it didn't have to do anything strange, I think. And white means it did do some kind of adding of points or rearranging things. And now let us go to font info. And we're going to turn on the 
I'm going to change the default weight to like 500 or so. And everything gets bolder. And this is an extra way of checking that interpolation is happening correctly. Uh-oh. Look at some of these A circumflex glyphs. That's interesting. So you notice that once we did this interpolation, yeah, there are a few things that are messed up. And it appears to mostly be accented characters. Well, we can just rebuild those from the accents. <clears throat> so one could go through and mark these in red and, and for future fixing. But um, still, the overwhelming majority of the letters, especially all the sort of regular stuff, seem to be in good shape. There's only a, a handful that are munged this time. You will want to go through more carefully, though, I should point out, and make sure that your interpolations are doing what you, what you want. And that they're producing nice, smooth results. One way of doing that is to actually build the intermediate font. So how do you generate fonts from these? Tools, multiple master, generate instance. So you can pick the instance. Use instance name as style name. Well, what's that about? Um, if you go into font info, you can define primary instances. <clears throat> so for instance, I could say, I could put the slider at where I want a primary instance. And I would, by the way, I'd do all of them. So I do zero, hit primary instance plus, and then I can rename it. I could call zero hairline. Okay, and I could just keep this open. And I could do, you know, 140 light. Oops, reminder to self, do not hit enter in that situation. I will, it doesn't do anything horrific, but um, the, uh, the primary instance functioning is a little buggy. Uh, 140, uh, light, and so on. Once you've done these, the interesting thing is you can generate fonts oh no oh it's getting it from the access panel in Yeah, so we've got these instances defined. And now, if we go Tools, Multiple Master, Generate Instance, it knows certain instances, right? It knows the ones we've defined. So I can say, Generate the Semibold, hit OK, and bang, it creates the Semibold font. And from here, I can generate the font, and I get a normal font again. And the other thing I can do here is go and look at the outlines. The one right in the middle is sort of the most susceptible to, well, weirdness. I can go look at the outlines and verify to my heart's content that they're in good shape and there are no issues. Um, in general, if you build stuff from scratch, you're pretty safe. If you've blended fonts, then depending on your blend settings and so on. You, you may have some issues that you need, fix, need to fix. Okay, <clears throat> so the other way of doing it is assign master, by the way. You open two fonts, go to the first font, tools mask, assign font mask. Um, and then you save the font under a new name so you don't write over your original. Select the second font, and so on. Tools, multiple master, define new axis. So basically you stick one font in and the, the background mask layer of the other 
and then you add the axis and then use this feature tools multiple master mask to master so let's walk through that really quick I will get rid of my existing Lato MM goodbye tools uh, what was it tools mask assign font mask that's it I want to put Lato black in the background of the light I have to find an axis which is weight okay yeah <clears throat> Then, oh, why did that not work? Oh, it's in the background. Yep, we've got wait one in the background. Now at the moment, though, the light glyphs, you'll see when I switch masters here, I've still got the light glyphs in both spots, but I've got wait one in the, the background. Tools, multiple master, oh. There it is, mask to master. So I want to replace the bold weight with the mask layer. And again, it's giving me the option of do not insert points. And I can get, that's something you need to experiment with potentially depending on your particular situation. So you might, for instance, save it here and then try it both ways to see which one is going to yield the result that causes you less work. Uh, oops, yeah, I should select all. Tools, multiple master, mask to master, wait one, okay, yes. And because I did it, the do not insert points option, I have more, more issues, or more obvious issues anyway. I go to font info, I'll change my default weight to be something around the middle and uh, that shows you where your your problem glyphs lie now I could do this again there's nothing stopping me uh, from repeating the option So this time I told it, told it, you know, take that mask layer and do it again, only this time do insert points. Eh, this did not actually produce a better result. Ooh, in fact, much worse. So I think I, I did a better job the first time. But anyhow, that's the, the general approach. Yeah, oh, I did have select all glyphs in there. I just forgot to do it. So, we've already shown you a bit about editing multiple master fonts using the masters panel to switch between the masters. And obviously, if you have more than one axis, you might have, you know, that masters panel can get fairly long. One thing that I wanted to point out uh, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> oh, let's take this one. You have a separate view controls and selection controls, so you can pick which layer you're working on, and you can also pick which layers you want to be able to see. And even if I clear the mask, so I cleared the background layer, but if I have all my layers visible at once, this gets pretty confusing with four masters, and God help you if you have eight. So, you know, you may want to pick carefully which layers you are showing yourself when you're doing the editing. And that's why it's helpful to be able to toggle the visibility separately from the, the selection. Alrighty. And I've already talked a bit about the whole multiple master weight thing, but essentially 
the the exercise of adding glyphs can be done a couple of different ways. One, let's say I want to make small caps. And although this font actually already has small caps at the moment, um, I'm going to kill them because <clears throat> I don't like them anymore. Or, well, not actually true, but now it doesn't have small caps. So there are a couple of ways of doing this. One is to do it by hand, essentially. I can say, okay, my, my, my X height is here, 435. Let's say my small cap height is going to be 500. And this would involve doing a little math. <clears throat> my caps currently are what? 685. So what did I say my X height was? 435? And let's say I'm going to make the small cap height, uh, oh, I don't know, 480. <clears throat> so small caps are going to be 480 over 685. In the scaled height, what about weight? So that is going to make them roughly, you know, 30% lighter. And that isn't what I want. So the other thing I could do is I could go in here and measure my stems and say, okay, my lightweight has stems of 25. You know, my extra lightweight, whatever. Lightmaster has stems that are cap stems are 25. My black master, my cap stems are. Oops, let's turn off all these extra things because it's confusing to even see. Black master, my cap stems are 181. <coughs> And I could basically plunk this, you know, do some math calculation here, saying how far do I have to go? What percentage of the way from 25 to 181 do I have to go so that when I multiply that number by 480 over 685, I get back to 25? And the same question again for 181. Um, assuming I want the, math, the small caps exactly the same weight as the caps. Um, the truth is, I might be willing to have them a smidge lighter, especially on, at least on the Black Master. Um, but you can do that math, <clears throat> and well, what the heck? Let's quickly do it. For some of you, I know this is like, yeah, this is easy, and for others of you, um, you're saying, no, no, I need that. So 480 over 685 is 70 percent. So yeah, it's, it's almost exactly 30%. Um, so I am going to lose um, 30% off of each of these numbers when I scale down the caps. So 25. Seventeen point five, we'll call it, and yes, it'll it'll round. And these will be one twenty seven. <clears throat> so the question is, 
how much of the way from what percentage of the way do I have to go from 17.5 to 127 to get back to 25? I need to add 8. Uh, I'm getting 11 steps per unit. I'm getting uh, moving up a whole the whole thing is 110. So what percentage of 110 is sorry 109 really? 8 over 109 is 0.07. Now the space, the multiple master space, you'll notice that the master is numbered from 0 to 1. So, or sorry, 0 to 1,000. So that is, I want the 73 interpolation. Um, and here I would want to extrapolate to 1,073. Um, I think. Oh no, wait a minute. No, I need to go more than that. I If I wanted to get back up to 181, but let's say I want to get up to about 170. I'd probably be checking what the, the lowercase stems are as well. Let's say the lowercase stems were 160. I want to get to 170. Um, so 170 minus 127 uh, is 43. I'm sorry for all the math. I'm going to show you an easier way, but it requires in, an investment. Um, so 40. So that's 43 more out of 110. Okay. So 153 out of 110. So 1390. So basically, I would spin off one font at one interpolated instance at 73, and I spin off another instance font at 1390, and I would shrink all those glyphs, <coughs> glue them back together, glue those two together as a multiple master, and then copy their glyphs, the, the now shrunk capitals, into the small caps of this one. And I'm going to save a few steps because I'm hoping that is reasonably self-evident how that works. Um, <clears throat> so that is how you do stuff like that. It takes a little bit of work, but yeah, so maybe it takes you half an hour. It's a lot less work than actually designing small caps from scratch. But there's a secret. And... I am going to show you that secret because I am nice. And the secret is something called the RMX tools. And RMX has a whole host of tools, including the scaler, that allow you to do interesting things. So I just copied and pasted the existing caps into the small caps, and that's going to be complete with, oh, hmm. some of them aren't ending up in the, oh, I have some alternates that I didn't get. Yeah, some of them aren't ending up in the right slots right off. <clears throat> Obviously, I can fix that. I'm not going to, going to bother. And the interesting thing about the scaler is it knows about the weight and width of the stems, and it's going to do all of those compensations for me. <clears throat> so I can say, you know, the small caps are going to be 70% of the height uh, in both the thinnest and the heaviest. <clears throat> Here's the stem weights I want them to have. And Uh, 
I want them to be a smidge wider. <clears throat> and will we give them more spacing? We can do that too. And bang. I probably look a they're a little too wide, I think. So I probably made an error there. But that is really, really easy. Now the RMX tools do cost money <coughs> um, to use them for commercial use. I think you can use them for free otherwise. Um, if you're just playing around. But if you issue a commercial font, you need to spend money on them. I find them truly awesome. They do a whole bunch of other things for multiple master type design. Um, we've already gone over the generating font stuff again. Um, use the mmpref settings in font info to set the default and primary instances. <clears throat> If you just take your MM and generate a font, you're going to get whatever is currently set as the default instance. It might be the regular, it might be whatever the 50% middle interpolation is. If you use the MM generate instance command, then you can pick anything you want and you've got a pop down for the predefined primary instances. If you're working with a big MM family, it can be handy to have a script to actually have a Python script that generates all the instances and does whatever other twiddly things you need done. So let's talk about problems. You've already seen some of them. Uh, there can be other problems. Contour order difference. So one interesting thing that can happen. Let's go back here. I'm going to create the problem which will also show you how to fix it. But let's look at our friend the colon. And hey, there's a colon here. What if um, in one of these masters something like this happened? Um, uh, I will show you something nasty. Oops, didn't mean to do it like that. Go back up. So I'm actually going to swap these two contours. And I guess I don't really need to do it terribly scientifically because. No, no, I want the other one. There we go. Yeah, it doesn't have to be precise. But once I've done that, some interesting things happen in the interpolation. Let's turn on the preview and let's start playing with when I start swapping the weight they swap sides in the middle they're a big blob and then they end up deformed and also just more important and out of position hmm, the deformed is another problem we'll talk about that in a minute um, now obviously the thing to do then is to figure out which master has them in the wrong order if you've only got two masters you could swap you could you just need to pick one of the masters and swap the positions to make this problem go away. But it's it's gnarly when that happens. Um, and it can be especially bizarre and confusing if it happens in something like this 8 here. Another kind of problem that can happen is when one of the and we actually we saw this in the colon, so I'm going to go back to it. What happens when one of the points is in a different spot across the outlines? So here, I think we were seeing this. So there's point number one. It's the first point in the contour. Remember, contours do have an order. Boop. This is still point one here. Uh, that's good in that outline. And that's the first point. 
sorry, point number one. It's actually contour number one, but that's the first point. And it's the first point in that outline and that one. Okay, it doesn't actually shift between the outlines. That's good. If, for instance, I'm going to do something odd just to be evil. Let's say that you had this situation. Perfectly good circle still, but the order of the points is different. Watch what this does to the interpolation. You notice how they, not only are they moving around, but that one just shrank down to nothing before it grew again. Um, yeah, so it does bad things. And sometimes you may have to just copy the outline to the, the mask background and uh, trash you know, one version of the outline in favor of the other and then rearrange the points. <clears throat> In the case of a circle, obviously, you can just rotate it, but that's not always the case. Um, kinking. Now here's an interesting little problem. Let us open this. So sometimes you have complicated curves. Obviously a circle isn't one of them, but let's pretend this is part of something else and I had some reason to have an extra point here. Now you have to have the same number of points on one master as the other. So these are technically compatible, but that point is jumping around. Now there are two, two ways to make, that, make this okay. One is that the angle of these three points, those two, those two off curve points and the one on the curve, if that angle is constant, then this thing can move around all you want and nothing terribly strange is going to happen in the interpolation. If you need the angle to change, as it does here, that's not necessarily a problem, but if you do that, you need to make sure that the ratio of the distance from here to here how long that is compared to this distance from here to here needs to remain constant across the masters. Now in this case, this arm is much longer than this arm in the one master, and it's the opposite in the other. So as we can predict, something weird is going to happen in the interpolation. Look at the interpolated uh, circle. It's got this big dent in it. Not good. Same thing, by the way, it's not just circles, but these things are forming a straight line. Now there's really no reason to have an extra point there, but let's pretend there is for a second. So if we rotate this rectangle, it's all good, but look what happens with that, this point here. It creates this huge kink. Now if it wasn't for that, the rectangle would be rotating fairly smoothly, right? If I delete this, it's all smooth rotation. What is going on with this point? Well, the problem is, in this one master, it is towards this corner. But in the other master, instead of being over here, it's over here, right? So the interpolation gets munged. So those are the, the kinds of problems, or kinking, it's generally referred to, you have to look out for. where I talked about start point mismatch, uh, contour order difference, overlap removal. In general, I'll just very simple rule of thumb. There are plenty of situations, let's look at this yen symbol for instance, <clears throat> where if as this weight goes up, let's say that as the weight goes up, Let's see, weight one with zero, weight one with one. Okay, in this case, the crossbars on the yen never start to run into the, the V part of the Y. If they did, I could have some interesting problems. And one way to avoid those sorts of problems, and especially for instance with, oh, I don't know, the Euro symbol, Uh, 
oh, I don't have a euro in here. That's odd. I guess my demo version does not have it. Um, or the O slash or what have you. With glyphs like this, ah, see, I've actually left the slash separate. That's a separate contour from the O. In fact, the O is just a component in this case. But even if it wasn't, it would be good to have the slash as a separate outline and only remove the overlap after you generate your separate fonts. And that avoids a number of problems that can happen in, in, in the interpolation if you just try to uh, do these straight. And we've talked about the solutions here. <clears throat> we've talked about kinking. And this is from that Adobe TechNote I mentioned earlier. TechNote 5091. Gotta love it. Um, now, their illustration here is wrong in the sense that it shows a kink where it wouldn't actually happen. So very briefly, we've add-on MM tools. We've talked about RMX, Remix tools, remix-tools.com. They're useful in general, and they're just truly awesome if you are going to make a habit of working with multiple masters. Um, they are indispensable. Superpolator adds a lot of refinements to designing in a multiple master space. It does uh, require the UFO format for interchange. Uh, <clears throat> you can export to and from UFO. Actually, I say forthcoming. The, our VFB to UFO command line tool is out there, so we have a quick way to convert font lab fonts to UFO and back. And finally, some resources and links. Remix tools, <clears throat> a long blog post I wrote some years back on MM fonts and remix tools, how to install add-ons for Robofab and scripting, and the any meeting recording. We will have that up in a couple of days, so I can't give you the URL yet, but it will go out to you who have been in this meeting, and also we'll try and get it to everybody who attended before. Okay, so questions. <clears throat> Anything I can answer for y'all? I know we're a small group today, but I will give you a couple minutes for questions. Uh, let you ponder. I will say, by the way, that I love, love working with with multiple masters. Um, there aren't really any... So Jimmy was asking if there are any complications with composites. Not really. I mean, composites still work like they did before. You may need to be careful to position the components in each master. But other than that, um, there, there are no real complications for composites. But as I was saying, I love working with multiple master fonts. It's a little more work, but man, there's just a great deal of satisfaction out of being able to generate some often seemingly unreasonably large number of fonts from a smaller number of masters. It's pretty awesome. Well, thanks for coming. And, oh, <clears throat> uh, where is VFB to UFO? Um, that's a good question. And um, I would just do a quick search on that using VFB to UFO, all as one, all as one word. <clears throat> and uh, that should pull it up. Um, so that's it for today. Thanks for coming and uh, the video will be available within a few days. Bye for now.